morning everyone and welcome to Falkirk Vineyard. I'm Saren. And I am Gavin. So the plan for this morning is that in a moment we are going to worship with Andrew Yule and Shanna. And then after that, our senior pastor Andrew McLynch is going to be continuing our series on Ephesians being and doing. And after the service we will continue on to Zoom where we will just get to hang out and pray together. And it's really fantastic. Come join us. But before we get to all that, we have a few announcements to make this morning. Now, the first one is on the kids' video. Now, Rachel has been doing an absolutely fantastic job with these, and we highly, highly, highly encourage you to go along and check them out, even if you're not a kid. You might just be a big kid at heart, that's <laughs> fine. You can find them at falkirkvineyard.com slash kids. Our next, uh, our next announcement is that small groups have started again. Woohoo! So they are running on Thursday nights at 8pm, apart from the youth one, which is at 7pm. So we, these small groups are a fantastic way just to get together and have a bit of fellowship and pray and worship and just dive into something a bit more with a small group of people. They're fantastic to be with and be a part of. So if you haven't signed up yet for one, there is still time. So please go to fullcuckvineyard.com forward slash small groups. The next announcement we have is our prayer gatherings. So the prayer gatherings are on Sunday evenings at 6pm and that means that there's going to be one tonight. So 6pm tonight and you can get the link to go along to these at falkirkvineyard.com slash pray. Our final announcement is we want to hear from you. If you have any stories about anything God has been doing in your life in the last few days or weeks or months, it can be something from some healing or if you have come along to the prayer meeting and we prayed for something you've been worried about and you've seen a wonderful result from it, we want to hear from you. So please send in your stories to stories at fullkirkvineyard.com and just let us know how God is working with you. And now, should we pray? Yeah. Okay. Father God, we thank you for the community that we have at Falkirk Vineyard. We thank you that we can get together and praise you. And we just ask that you would open our hearts and our ears just so we can receive what Andrew is saying to us today. Come meet with us. Amen. Amen. So now let's hand over to Chana and Andrew for some worship and then on to Andrew. Bye. Bye.
from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us all in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Hi everyone. So we are in week three of our series, Being and Doing, as we walk through um, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Um, and we're going to be doing that, um, or continuing that for the next few weeks. Now, last time out, Nikki spoke to us about who we are in Christ. And, and we often talk and sing about that, don't we? About our identity in Christ. We will sing, um, I am a child of God. I am who you say I am. Or we will quote scripture like, I can do all things through Christ. Or whoever believes in Christ will do even greater things than he did. And we know that Paul stated that in Christ we are a new creation. And Nikki also reminded us of this about our identity in Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. You are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. Amazing words. And now as we move into chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul further affirms the true nature of those who have accepted Christ and belong to him. And he does this by contrasting who we were before Christ and who we are in Christ. So today we are going to talk about God's grace. Now in our church we love to talk about grace. We love to be a people who show grace to, to one another and, 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 and where graciousness is just part of who we are. I, I love that about our church. But when it comes to grace, Jesus states that grace and love and kindness are identity markers of those who follow him. Grace, love and kindness are identity markers of those who follow him. Jesus said this in John 13. I am giving you a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love each other as I have loved you. That's a big mandate. So how did Jesus love? When John 4.22, it says this about Jesus. Everyone spoke well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his lips. And in John 1 it says this about Jesus, he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. For his, from his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Grace and love poured out of Jesus. He couldn't help it. And the grace of God is a beautiful thing. We love it, don't we? We love God's grace. It's encouraging, it's life-giving, and it feels great to know that God the Father wants to lavish such incredible goodness and love on us. But why does God's grace hold such importance? And why does Paul go on about it so much in his letters and in his life story in the book of Acts? 
Well, the Bible puts so much emphasis on God's grace because it is his grace that is the key to the salvation of humanity. The manifestation of God's grace in Christ is what brings us reconciliation with God. We all need God's grace. Every one of us has a past, right? And you might see your past as better or worse than someone else's past. But regardless of how we perceive our past, the Word of God tells us that every single one of us has a before Christ life. Ephesians 2, our chapter or, uh, for this week, says this. So we're going to read the first three verses. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. In this letter that Paul has written, it is crystal clear that he is directing his words towards Christians. We know this because he addresses this description of a life without Christ in the past tense. He says, once you were dead, you used to live in sin. All of us used to live that way. We were subject to God's anger. And, you know, I think it's hard to think about our lives that way. But it's true. Because before we met Christ, we were dead. Remember, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to improve your life or to make you feel better about yourself. Jesus came to make dead people live. Our lives before Christ were based on self. And Paul is revealing something here that is really hard for us to stomach. He's shown us that something that is confrontational and shocking that a life without Christ is a life dominated by evil. Now you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, slow down, that is too harsh, you can't say that. And I get it, this is a really tough one to swallow. But let's read these first three verses again. He said, or Paul said, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. In these times that we live in, truth is a rare and precious commodity. And this has caused us to become offended really easily. So let's not kid ourselves. These verses that I've just read are offensive, especially if you're not a Christian. How dare Paul say that I live in sin, that I obey the devil, that I have a sinful nature? But the truth is, that is the reality of our world. Romans 3 verse 23 says this, Everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And this is why the grace of God is necessary and central to our identity as disciples of Jesus. Because this disconnect from God is something that we cannot make right. We cannot earn or make reparation for our disconnect from God. But God loves us. He has taken the burden on himself to make this right and make a way for us to be in right relationship with him. As we go further on in Romans chapter 3, it says this, So everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. 
He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. We are so thankful for this, aren't we? Because Paul is laying out for us some uncom uncomfortable truths. Without Christ in our lives, we are, in fact, in conflict with God. There is no middle ground with this. There's no neutral zone. You're either right with God or you're not. But the good news is that God's will, his desire is for all of us, as Paul puts it, to be made right with God. And this is where God's grace breaks in. Without us even asking, he has made a way for us to be made right with him. We carry on in Ephesians 2 and it says this, But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Whenever Paul talks about salvation, he makes it abundantly clear that this grace um, that brings salvation isn't a one-dimensional transaction to get your ticket to heaven and sit around waiting to get there. God's mercy is so much more than that. God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much, he gave his life when he raised Christ from the dead. This rich deep and fathomable, gracious love of God raises us to life in Christ. Our, in our before life Christ, sorry, in our before Christ life as described in our verses, that life's gone. It's done. It's dead. You know, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He didn't come to improve your life or make you feel better about yourself. He came to make dead people live. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul describes what Jesus has done like this. It says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. The grace of God is a gift and the grace of God is a gift that keeps on giving. Yes, this grace has not only brought about our salvation, it also empowers us. God's grace is rich. His grace is always at work. God's gracious nature is that he offers his favour even though we didn't ask for it. So in this session, in the time left, we're going to look at God's grace in three contexts. We're going to look at how God's grace has dealt with our past. We're going to look at how God's grace sustains us in our life in the present and how God's grace is our fuel for our future. Paul is very clear that it is God's grace and his grace alone that provides salvation. It says it in verses 4 and 5 of Ephesians 2. God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. And then he continues to remind us again in verses 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this as a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. This is really, really important and foundational to salvation. And it is really important and foundational for our continuing journey of following Christ. 
Salvation is only possible because of what God has done. Salvation cannot be earned through our efforts to be good or to be better. Salvation is only possible because Jesus took upon himself all the sin of all humanity, past, present and future. In Christ, justice was served. He made the way for everyone to live, to be set free from the guilt and burden of sin. And you know, the Apostle Paul sums it up beautifully in in Romans 6 and 23. He says, "The, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we know these verses so well and I think sometimes we become over familiar and forget just how incredible these words are. I mean, this is incredible. God has made salvation available to everyone. God has a free gift for all and it's eternal life. But although this gift is offered freely from God and that we can't earn it and we can't make ourselves right with God, there is a part that you and I have to play. In verse 8 of our chapter, it says this, that God saved you by his grace when you believed. Paul's point here is that God's gift of salvation has to be accepted. It has to be accepted on the basis of faith and trust and confidence in God's promises and in his deeds which were worked out in Jesus. This is what makes salvation possible. You know, if you think about gifts, gifts are not only things that are given, gifts have to be received. And Paul is saying it is when you believed, when you received, God saved you by his grace. And many of you will have already accepted God's gift of salvation. You have declared that you believe Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sin to bring you salvation and that God raised him from the dead, a power so great that it was sufficient to bring new life to all humanity. And you have declared a commitment to live your life in the knowledge and in the identity that God has given you in Christ. You have accepted God's gracious gift. But for others though, you might not yet have accepted this gift of salvation. Maybe you have thought that by being a good person or being kind and thoughtful, being a good neighbour, a good friend, that that would earn you favour with God. Now let's not mistake it, God loves that we, if you have that kind of character. It pleases him that you want to live that way. However, that is not how you receive salvation. Paul is very clear. God saved you by his grace when you believed. So if you've not accepted that free gift of salvation, would you like to receive it? Would you like to receive this free gift of salvation? And if you would, I am delighted. So why not do it right now? You can pray to God right now. You can say to God that you believe that the only way to receive his salvation is to accept that Christ died for you, that you know you have sinned and you want his forgiveness, that you want to turn from a life without him and have a new life living for him. And as you say that prayer, God hears you and he says, you are welcome. If you have prayed this, then you have been saved by God's grace when you believed. Your past has been dealt with. Amen. So that's how grace deals with our past. But grace also sustains us in our present life. When you receive this gift of salvation, it is not a transaction to purchase your ticket to heaven. It's not box ticked so that come the big day, you can show your pass at the pearly gates. Paul is saying that this grace that has brought about our salvation, continues to work in us day in, day out. Ephesians 2 closes out, or sort of, our our first 10 verses, today we close out with these two verses, which is this, Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. Paul says this, Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, 
so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. Just let that sink in for a minute. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So we understand that God's salvation is not a reward for our good works, right? Because if it was, we could, in all fairness, take some credit. The point that Paul is making is really important as, in us understanding how we live as followers of Christ. Paul talks about boasting. So we have to maybe um, consider what boasting is. What is boasting? And what is the motive for boasting? Well, ultimately, to boast is to attempt to impress someone. And I think if we're being really honest, we all want to impress other people at least some of the time. It's a way of gaining credibility or acceptance. We want others to feel good about us so we feel good about ourselves. We want others to think well of us to boost our own self-worth. But the truth is this, you can't impress God. In fact, trying to impress God doesn't make any sense. Firstly, he knows everything about you. But more than that, he loves you and there's nothing you can do that can make him love you more. Lorraine and I have two daughters and we love them. I mean, we really love them. But they don't have to try and impress us to receive our love. We're not looking for them to keep showing us how amazing they are. We already think they're amazing. And there's nothing that they can do to make themselves more loved or more accepted by us. They have no reason to try and impress us. They have no reason to boast. God saved you by his grace when you believed in him. Good works don't save us and neither do they make you more saved or more acceptable. You can't impress God because he doesn't want you to try and impress him. And why is that? Because we are God's masterpiece. The Amplified Bible expands on this description of us being God's masterpiece like this. It says, for we are his workmanship, his own master work, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works. You cannot be more, more than that. You cannot be more impressive than that. God doesn't want you to impress him. He doesn't want you to appear in a certain way. You don't have to invent an identity that is better than God's masterpiece. You don't do good works to create an identity that is pleasing to God. We do good works because that is what characterises our identity in God. God doesn't want you to impress him. He wants you to please him. And how do we please him? Verse 10 tells us, He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Good works do matter. God wants us to, go, to do good things because that pleases him. And the Bible talks about this at length. Jesus speaks of um, doing, doing work, making the fields ready for harvest. That's sharing the good news of the gospel. The Bible talks about us bearing each other's burdens. That's good works about resisting sin, not giving into temptation, loving our enemies, taking care of the poor, encouraging one another, living by the Spirit. You know, what these things that are shown us is that these behaviours and attitudes are to become natural to us in contrast to our natural behaviours and attitudes before we were in Christ. So good works are important. And God wants us to do good things. But we have to get good works positioned correctly. Good works do not lead to salvation. Actually, it's the opposite. Salvation leads us into good works. So if you're trying to do stuff 
to earn God's favour, then you need to change your perspective. If God has saved you by his grace, you have God's favour. You don't have to try and impress him. You do things to please God because of his favour. And as we go forward in our life, God's grace fuels us for our future. In his writings, in his New Testament letters, Paul regularly describes the Christian life as a walk. In Galatians, he urges them to walk in the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit. And later on in Ephesians, we're going to find out that Paul continually compels us to walk worthy of our calling. So as you and I continue in our walk with God, we need fuel to keep us going. And that fuel is God's grace. Ephesians 2 and 4 says, God is so rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. As you walk with him, as you act to please him, God's grace continues to be poured into you. God's grace, his love is rich. It is being lavished upon us. And this, God does this so that, that he... Um, God does this so that he can demonstrate his grace and kindness to us and through us so that we can lavish grace and kindness on others just as he has done for us. God has saved us because he loves us and the result of this free gift of salvation is so that we might do good works fueled by his grace. This is our future. This is what God has planned for us. This is what he designed you for, you, his masterpiece. So as we come into land today, I just want you to know this, that God hasn't just given us his grace for salvation, and that is a great thing, but God wants us to live in his grace. He wants us to receive, experience and enjoy his grace, and he wants us to express his grace in our lives. And you know, this is at the very heart of the gospel. And, and we see it summed up in Mark 10, 45, which says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word ransom means that Jesus came to set us free. He came to set us free from sin, free from its guilt and its power. And eventually, in eternity, we will be free from its very presence in our lives. And as we read Romans 3 and 23, it reminded us that all have sinned, all of us. Our human condition is sin and sin results in separation from God and, and his condemnation of sin. But Jesus came into the world not to condemn us, but to give us that which we never deserved. And he did this by giving up his life and his blood that we might walk free from condemnation. And there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. God's grace is a gift. It is gratis, free. And God desires only that we accept it, experience it and enjoy it. We should revel in the grace of God. And we cannot earn God's favour. Think of the, 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 the repentant thief who died on one of the crosses alongside Jesus. He asked Jesus for forgiveness at the end of a life of theft, of doing wrong. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. In that moment, what could that thief ever have done to earn salvation? To earn God's grace? You know, actually earn Grace is a contradiction in terms. And how often do we try to earn God's grace and tear ourselves apart in the process? God wants us to express his grace in our lives. The life of grace will show itself by works without the quest to establish favour with God. I'm going to read that line again. The life of grace will show itself by works without the quest to establish favour with God. The true life of grace knows that God's favour has already been given as a gift and that is the transforming power of grace. 
And yet reality proves to all of us that we so often live lives that are ungracious, even as followers of Christ. We live lives where in actual fact we, we sometimes fall short and end up pleasing and uh, serving ourselves more than others. And when that happens, it's so easy to get on a guilt trip um, when we fail and to feel that there's something we have to do to get back on side with God. But no, if you fail, confess it and receive um, the promised forgiveness of God's grace. And remember, even when things go wrong, even when you fail, even when uh, you, you're not expressing uh, the grace of God in the way that you know that you should and that you want to, remember God is never finished with you. He never gives up on you. Rather, as it says in Philippians 1 and 6, God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Didn't Jesus say he would be with us until the end of days? Doesn't the word of God tell us that he will never leave us or abandon us? You know, God's grace is not a one-time thing for salvation. God's grace lives with us and is with us um, for all eternity. And God wants us to live in his grace. He wants us to receive, experience and enjoy his grace. And he also wants us to express his grace in our lives towards others. Because people of God, that is who you are. You are saved by grace, sustained by grace and fueled by grace. And because God's grace gives you your identity, you don't have to strive for his favour or for his love. Just accept his gift of grace and be who you are in Christ. Thank you so much, everyone. What a great service this morning. I just love being in God's presence. I love um, just hearing God's word and then singing God's word. I'm singing to God, rather. Um, just love it. What an incredible, sweet time this morning. And this morning, we have Lois join us for the ministry time. And um, Lois is um, learning to hear from God and is training and getting training in the prophetic and she is just pushing into all that God has for her so I, I thought what a great thing to get Lois to come along and hear what Lois has been hearing from God for you Falkirk Vineyard so Lois welcome so good <laughs> have you heard has God been speaking to you at all um, about Falkirk Vineyard was there anything you'd like to share with us this morning yeah I've got a few things so the first thing was um, when I sat down um, and I just asked God what it was he had to say um, to the church. And I just got a sense that there's someone who has been exploring and kind of talking to God about um, hearing from God. And it was like they were asking why in a very like loving way, like why, why God? And God is saying it's because he loves you and he loves to speak to you. And the sense that I really got was that if that's for you, that you have to read the Bible and um, because God is all over the Bible. And as you're reading it, there will be verses that are highlighted to you. So you should highlight those verses and then um, or anything that stands out um, and just think them over and mull that over for um, some amount of time um, and meditate over that. Um, because in that God is showing you something and he is teaching you how to hear him speak but it all starts in scripture um, love and that. love that uh, so good the other thing I got was that I felt like um, for someone that God is inspiring creativity and the sense I got was that it was like we were outside and there was like an inspiration of creativity in the wind um, and I think that this word is for someone who would think of themselves as a logical thinker, um, but God is actually inspiring creativity in you. And I got a sense that you should go out for walks and be inspired by the things that God has created, because God is both logical and creative. So those things can coexist. Um, and I think that you're going to be inspired and get a lot of inspiration from how you see God has made things Um just around you so that's quite exciting and uh, the last thing really that I got was just that I really felt like God was saying to me that I have to pray for healing this morning so I'm going to be on the zoom call 
Um, so if there's anything that you would like um, prayer for after the service for healing, whether it's physical or emotional, then I would love to pray for you. And the in the Bible, there's lots and lots of stories of people being healed um, in lots of different ways. And I really believe that if it's in the Bible and we read it there, then it's for us because it is true and it's God's word and God has said to us that we are to do things that he has done. He has shown us, he's given us the Bible and shown us what to do. And he will show up this morning and heal people. I'm really excited to, to pray for people this morning. So, and I'm sure there'll be lots of other people to pray for you too. It'll not just be me. So come on the Zoom call if you would like prayer for anything I've said this morning. If you would like prayer for healing, um, I would love to pray for you this morning to see you. Fantastic. So you got that. If you if you identify with anything low said prophetic words, or if you want prayer for anything at all, for healing or anything, you're just struggling at the moment, then come on the Zoom call in a few minutes because we would love to pray for you. And you've got Lois who's going to come and pray for you too. So why not? What a great opportunity. So um, in a moment, um, we're going to be going over to Zoom. So if you're watching us on YouTube or on Facebook, then you will need to go onto our online platform and in the chat, there'll be the link that you just have to click on there and you'll just go straight into Zoom. So before we do that, why don't we pray and then I'll get to see your lovely faces. Father God, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come into your presence and in your presence, we change, our hearts change, our circumstances. Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you that you are available to us every day, 24 seven, that we are not on our own, that you are with us wherever we go, you are there. And Father, I just pray, Father, for people who need that extra touch this morning, Father, would you just meet them in a new and fresh way and may they know how loved they are. I ask these things. In your precious name. Amen. 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 So I will see you all on Zoom. <laughs>